Hey, we're glad to have you with us. Isn't it great to be together? Isn't it great to be able to laugh together in church? Wow, it's what we're here for is to enjoy and rejoice in our relationship with each other and with God and to be blessed in what we're doing. Uh, so we are very happy to have you with us. Now, I need to get my changer. If you'll give me a second, I'll do that. That way I can actually, we can actually move beyond the first slide, hopefully to the correct ones, but uh, we'll see. So uh, let's, let's confess together our, our common faith as Christians, okay? I am a child of God. I'm saved by grace. I live each day by faith. And I'm ready to hear God's word. I hope you are. It's a short reading. If you'll stand, please, as we honor God in the reading of his word. We read this morning from Acts 5, verses 12 to 16. Listen as we read. The apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders among the people. And all the believers used to meet together in Solomon's colonnade. No one else dared join them, even though they were highly regarded by the people. Nevertheless, more and more men and women believed in the Lord and were added to their number. As a result, people brought the sick into the streets and laid them on beds and mats so that at least Peter's shadow might fall on some of them as he passed by. Crowds gathered also from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing their sick and those tormented by evil spirits, and all of them were healed. May God bless this short but amazing passage from his word, and his people said. God bless you. Please have a seat. Kids, we want to dismiss you for your lesson. It's going to be a great one. Kids, we want you to know as you go out, we love you. We're glad you're here. God has blessed us with you. You're awesome. You're awesome. <laughs> yeah. And while everybody leaves, well, there's a few of us left. We want to continue our journey through the book of Acts, looking at what I'm calling a series called Pictures of the Early Church. As we watch the church evolve, as we watch the church develop under the hand of God and under the guidance of the Holy Spirit and under the earthly leadership of the apostles that Jesus had chosen, God gives us glimpses. He shows us a lot about what being Christian is all about as he intended it to be at the beginning and I believe as he intends it to be today. And so we want to look at this little, uh, it's kind of an interlude passage in the middle of Acts. We're right in the middle of all this stormy stuff going on. And right in the middle of it, God drops in this little passage. It's very brief, very encouraging. And I entitle it, A Brief Period of Peace. And trust me, it is a brief period of peace. If you think about it, you know, our, our kids had, a, our kids had a, 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 a tough weekend in Cookville, didn't they? They went up there, and they, they had a couple of, you know, that rivalry game, you know, like it or not, I'm not going to make comments about people in the game that might have been involved, but I'm saying, you know, anytime there's a rivalry game especially, emotions run high, there's a lot of intensity. I think when you're in a rivalry game, you, you uh, and, and players, you can tell me if I'm wrong, but I think you put out a lot more energy. I mean, you just really ramp it up and push it because, I mean, this is a, you know, you think about these guys playing the Super Bowl today, and they, they were, they've asked the coaches, what do you do to get your team up for Super Bowl? And one of the coaches looked up and said, if I have to get these guys up for the Super Bowl, there's something wrong with them. I mean, you're talking about the world championship. If you can't get motivated to play this game, there ain't nothing I can do to get you motivated. And that's true. But in the midst of all of that, the most wonderful moment in a game when you're playing is at the end of the quarter and at halftime. And the reason is this. You get to rest. You get to downsize a little bit for a few seconds and catch your breath and build your energy back up and get your mind refocused. We need those. The Bible calls them seasons of refreshing. Jesus did them. There were times when the Bible says Jesus would withdraw from the crowds and go off by himself. Sometimes it says to pray. Sometimes it just says he went off by himself. He needed those seasons of refreshing. 
You look at the prophets, and many times they had periods of isolation. Moses went off by himself from time to time. It's just something that we all recognize. It's kind of part of the Sabbath concept that God has. God understands that you can only push real hard for so long, and then you get careless, and you lose your energy, and you kind of get burned out. So, And God knows that in the life of the church. I'm convinced that as I read Acts, there are these times of just incredible, intense activity. The church has just started. They're running hard and heavy. I mean, they've converted several thousand. They're meeting every day. They're, they're praying. They're fasting. They're reaching out. They're preaching. All these people are coming in. Somebody's baptizing somebody. I, I'm convinced almost every minute of the day. Somebody somewhere is baptizing somebody else. These people are coming in. They're taking care of food. They're getting clothing. They're housing them. They're meeting together and praying and singing. And it's just the, 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 the pace is frenetic. And in the midst of that, there's been a certain level of persecution already going on. They've caught the attention of the Jewish authorities. They're beginning to follow them around and spy on them and call a few of them out and shake them up every now and then and that kind of thing. In the midst of all of this, one common denominator is the church continues to grow. One of the beautiful things is it grows in both prayer and giving. These are a couple of them we've actually seen in looking at Acts 2 and Acts 4. Is that, you know, whatever happens, this church continues to pray together. They have a, we're going to find out in a minute, they have a commonly known meeting place. And, you know, they show up. I want you to think about that. How would you feel if you were the Jewish authorities and on one side of the temple, about 10,000 Christians show up a couple of three times a day to pray in the name of Jesus? Number one, it's a little intimidating, but number two, it's a little bit irritating. These people are not like your people anymore. They're following this Jesus guy. And you've already made it known you're not happy with that. We look at the giving. And in Acts 2, we're told there was immense generosity. In Acts 4, it's illustrated for us in Barnabas and others. In chapter 5, at the beginning, since they were so generous and so, so uh, uh, giving to one another, the first thing Satan attacked in the church was the spirit of giving. He tried to introduce hypocrisy and rivalry and, and you know uh, one-upmanship into that process, and they just squashed that really fast. But, but that was going, which reminds me, by the way, when Satan tried to corrupt the church with this hypocrisy of, you know, giving one thing but claiming another, it wasn't the amount that was given, it was the way it was handled. Okay? Um, these folks gave, they, they sold a property, they gave most of it to the church, they kept some of it back for themselves. There was no fault in that, but when asked what they'd given, they said, this is the full price of what we sold. They're trying to lie about what they're doing for God, and they're trying to make themselves look good because, you know, they're kind of embarrassed by what other people are doing. Well, God's not going to tolerate that kind of just, just open deceit. It's not the way Christians do business. And so God intervenes in a very drastic way and puts to death Ananias and Sapphira. And you would think that would kind of squelch things. And the Bible said there was a lot of permeating fear within the church. I can see why. I bet everybody thought twice before they made their contribution on Sunday. But having done that, and despite this attack from Satan, what happens? And that's what our passage shows us today. They just put that thing in fourth gear and just keep rolling. They just keep it going. They've got their focus. They're focused on the cross. They're focused on the gospel message. They want to see that Jesus is preached. The apostles and several others are out proclaiming Jesus. People continue to come and to come and to come and to come. And, you know, you think about the logistics of that. The rest of the membership have plenty to do. They're taking care of folks. You talk about benevolent ministry, they had, they had a, a full time. Every member of the church was involved in the benevolent ministry, the clothing ministry, the food ministry. 
the backpack ministry, if you want to call it. I mean, they, everybody was in the backpack ministry because every time a new person walked into the assembly and it was like constantly. You know, we come in sometimes and you look around and you think, wow, all these new people, it's so cool to see them in there. Imagine doing that every day when you meet together, there's two, three, four hundred new people that you don't recognize. Some of them don't even speak your language. Some of them are dressed kind of funny. Some of them don't understand what's being said and done. Nobody, nobody knows how to do church yet. They haven't burdened the work of God with human tradition yet. People don't know the church talk. They don't know the, about the committee. They didn't have committees, did they? They didn't have committees. They didn't have organized this and programmed that. They were just taking care of each other. And a lot of this was adding more and more to the apostles, by the way, who were trying to kind of manage all of this, while at the same time trying to really do what God called them to do, which was what? Preach Jesus. That's all they wanted to do. And we'll see that in chapter 6 when we get to that. But, but I see a couple of short, small truths. Well, small truths. Huge truths that come out of this passage of about five or six verses. The first truth is this. When God's power and presence are seen, people are forced to make choices. When the church sits there like a nut on a log, when the church just keeps the doors open, and let's face it, most churches, that's their agenda, right? Keep the door open, keep the lights on, try to pay the bills. If that's the whole goal of the church, nobody in the community is forced to make any decisions about that group. They're harmless they not bothering anybody, you know. But you let a church come alive and they start, you know, reaching out and, and ministering to people and helping folks in the community and serving. And when you see them walking around in small groups and they're just happy and they're rejoicing and they're spending time together and when all of a sudden the guys that used to meet you at the, at the, the honky-tonk on Friday night, you know, they're not available anymore because they're going to a men's Bible study somewhere or they're, they're helping to, to take food off to a, a family that has need. People notice that kind of stuff. You don't have to go around the town and say, well, you know, the Cumberland Heights Church of Christ is doing this. Cumberland Heights Church of Christ is doing that. Hey, we're the Cumberland Heights Church of Christ. Did you notice all the things? You don't have to do that. People know. People know. People know where you are. People know who you are. People know what you're doing. People also know what you're not doing. So if you're sitting around like a lump, people know that. You ask them about a certain church. I don't know anybody from that church. I've never seen them or heard them do anything. But when God brings a body of disciples to life, and when we really release ourselves to the service of God and do all the good things, Bible school, outreach, benevolence, you know, we talk about programs. I'm not the least bit interested in programs. I'm interested in service. When we're out there just getting our hands on the lives of people and, and, and making a difference. I, I heard about a church the other day. We got some new kids at our school, two little kids. And our, our principal said, I'd like to talk to you about them. I think you as a counselor need to know a little bit about their background. Two little guys, one second grade, one kindergarten. They moved in from Detroit, Michigan. And they came down to Tennessee because they couldn't afford to live in Michigan anymore. And they came down here because it's cheaper. But the only way they could get into a place, and anybody that's ever tried to rent or buy knows this, you ever tried to get first and last month rent together, first and last month utility, it cost you $50,000 to get to rent a house. They were living in a hotel at $850 a month, sleeping on the couches and eating out once a night to have their meal. They had one meal a day, and that was on, on the couch. At, at, that was uh, at night, right after school. Kids would get home. They'd go out and have dinner. This was their life. They couldn't go anywhere else. They couldn't get into anywhere else because, frankly, when you're spending eight fifty a month plus food to survive and you're both working low-paying jobs, how are you going to save money to get in a, an apartment or a house? You can't. 
So I know of a church in Cookville that said, we're going to one of the members there. This wasn't an official program. One of the members said, I want to sponsor that family. Let's see what we can do to help them. The church helped them get in a house. Some of the members went over. They painted it up. They cleaned it up. They got them some furniture. They put them in that house. They can now afford that house. They paid the first and last month to, uh, the, of the uh, uh, utility so that they could get in there. These kids are flourishing now, and their family is doing so much better, and that church continues to hover over them and protect them and make sure that they're okay. Now, that's, that's what being church is about. They didn't say, well, let's, we have to go to our elders and we have to go through a program here and we have to decide, we'll have to see our deacon. One of the members just said, hey, God has touched my heart. This is something I need to do. What can we do? And that person approached several other people and before you know it, they had a committee. It wasn't called a committee. It was just a group of people that said, we will make a difference. We'll do the painting. We'll do the cleaning. We'll get them in there. This family is so grateful. These kids are doing so much better. They're good little guys. But left where they were, what chance did they have? You know? They went from being homeless to being, you know, regular members of the community. What a beautiful thing to see. When we look at this few verses here, verses 12, 13, and 14, you see God's power coming alive in this church. And as they reach out and they touch out and they begin to make differences in lives of people, it stirs the pot of the community. And people start noticing. In response to their earlier, what did they pray? When the, when, the, when the Jewish council called the apostles in, beat up on them a little bit, threatened them and told them to keep their mouths shut and not talk about Jesus anymore. The Bible says they went back, remember the phrase, to their own people? That's fellowship. And what's the first thing they prayed? God, make us bold in our preaching. And there was a second thing they prayed for. Give us signs to authenticate our message. And boy, did God give them to them. Now, you let a church get busy doing the Lord's work the way they should and really engaged in their community the way Christians ought to be, God will accompany you. He will open eyes. He will show the way. You just take care of the business. And God will take care of the signs and wonders, whatever it is he chooses to do. In every generation, God's had his own way of making his people known when they're busy doing his work. So God empowers the apostles. Look at verse 12. It says, the apostles perform many miraculous signs and wonders among the people. That's what the apostles had asked for. That was one of their, one of their rather exclusive domains. They were the performers of the wonders. And I think God probably kept it fairly limited to them because he didn't want the signs and wonders to be abused. So he put it in the hands of those who had been trained for this ministry by Jesus. Jesus had even told them during his own ministry that they would do these things. I don't think they believed it at the time. Now they're believing it and then some. So they're doing these signs and wonders. And by the way, those are the phrases in the Bible that are used to describe things that are done to authenticate the message of God. So they're, they're developing street cred, aren't they? They're developing street cred. People are saying, hey, how can you say they're not men of God? He just healed my sister. He just, my blind brother who's never seen, he was born blind. Now he can see because that man Peter laid his hands on him and healed him. Hey, I believe anything he says. That's the way it was designed to work. Now, at the same time, you look at the second half of verse 12, what else do you find out? We got the individuals, the apostles, doing signs and wonders, and you got the church doing what church is supposed to do, which is what? They're faithful to the word, and they're one. They're united. They hang together. And notice what it says. It says all the believers. You hear the word all? All the believers used to meet together in Solomon's colonnade. Now that seems like an, an innocent little statement, but it says a world. All the believers met together. Used to meet together. The word used to means it was their practice or custom or habit to meet together. Solomon's colonnade is on one side of the temple. It's a large public assembly area. And at this point, it became the first church building 
in, their, in, in the New Testament world. I mean, it wasn't designed for that, and it wasn't leased to the church, but there were so many. How are you going to tell 6,000 people they can't meet there? And so they meet together, and it's funny because people would gather with them, and I think they probably were like, what are these people doing? They're all singing about this Jesus guy and hearing these guys talk about Jesus and all these unbelievers that are just mixed in with the crowd. They're like, what, what is this stuff? But you know, you see the way they love each other, and you see their affection for each other, and you hear the positive comments that are being made, and you're like, well, maybe I need to listen to this. This might be something pretty interesting. And so that's what happens. Now, here's, here's the problem. When people witness and hear the good things of the kingdom of God, it kind of forces them to make a choice. You know, it, it raises something they've maybe never thought about. And now, all of a sudden, there it is right, I mean, it's right in your face. You're standing next to two of these Christian things here, these Christian people's persons, whatever they are, you don't even know what they are. They don't even call themselves Christians at this point yet. They're just followers of Jesus. You don't know anything about this whole thing, but here you are with a bunch of them around you, and they're just singing their hearts out, and they're patting each other. Hey, it's good to see you. How you doing? Hey, did you, did you get that meal we sent over to you? Yeah, yeah. well, listen, now, do you all need anything else? Because if you do, i got a half a dozen folks here that will help you out. Did you get that rent covered? You know, they're just taking care of each other. And taking care of their worship, their worship to God is just a wonderful thing. And you have two reactions that are mentioned. The first is in verse 13. No one else dared join them. And I love the next statement, even though they were highly regarded by the people. There's the fear factor. There's always big brother standing over you with the axe. Huh? Huh? Can you imagine this scene? All these milling Christians by the hundreds and thousands are just gathering around, and they're singing and all this. And here's some of the Jewish rulers standing up on the top stair, and they look like they've just sucked a raw lemon. Their faces are all puckered up and drawn in, and they got to do look in your face like, what do you think you're doing? You can see it. You, you can just imagine it. I've been in churches where I've seen that. We had, a, we had a guy one time in Ohio, we baptized him, and when he came up out of the water, he shouted, Hallelujah, and I thought half the membership was going to die of a heart attack right there. <laughs> you don't say hallelujah in the church? Really? Not in this one. <laughs> so they rushed, you know, the elders rushed forward and took him aside and said, Now, son, we need to talk. <clears throat> it's all right to have the joy of the Lord, but don't show it. Isn't it silly the way we play these games? Somebody said, "How do you? what would you do if somebody raised their hands during prayer? I don't care. If that's what you need to do, do it. What does that have to do with anything? You're just, if, if that's your way to honor God, honor God. My goodness. So you've got some folks here, they just, they just can't get that stick out of the mud. It's all hung up, and they don't know what to do. They like these people. Did you see the phrase, highly regarded? These people made, made a fabulous impression on them. But they're not going to hang out with them. Because Aunt May might not like it. Uncle Jimmy might get upset. The rabbi might not talk to me. You know something? There comes a time in life where family and friends and associates, you've got to make choices. Jesus said you can't love father or mother, brother or sister, son or daughter more than you love him. And if you have to make that break, you make that break because Christ comes first. And besides that, if you truly are a Christian and the church you're a part of is truly made of Christians, you've gained a whole new family anyway. And maybe with God's help and guidance, some of that old family will come along with you. You just never know. Because the next verse suggests something else. Some responded in fear, but others, the Bible says, became Christian. Look at verse 14. Nevertheless, that's what we call a contrary statement. 
If you look at verse 13, it sounds like, well, they were good and they were faithful and they were full of joy and they praised God and they met all the time, but they just couldn't convert anybody. No, it says they couldn't convert some. Some people don't want that. Some people are afraid of that. But other people who are willing to listen and who are willing to think through exactly what's being said and what it means and eternity and immortality and salvation, you know, once you plug into all that and you intellectually begin to process it, all of a sudden it starts making a whole lot of sense. And then they start listening to testimony of the apostles and they start realizing these guys are quoting the Old Testament. The, they're, they're talking about a Jesus who fulfilled the prophecies of the Old Testament. That's powerful stuff if you're Jewish. And they're like, oh, so you're saying this Messiah the Bible's always talked about, you're saying Jesus is the Messiah. And then they said, oh yeah, and he did signs, and he did wonders, and we do signs, and we do wonders. And oh, by the way, he died and was raised from the dead. Now that's one that's hard to argue with. And then they started doing the testimony about the resurrection, and then they started talking about transformed lives. If any man's in Christ, he's a new creation. And then they look around him and they see all these new creations act like new creations they're generous they're loving they're caring they're warm they they they're full of joy and it's like whoa I, i've got to, i've got to at least give this some thought and you know the more some of them thought about it the closer they got to god and they just they finally just said i've got to do this i'm going to go where i've got to go because god is leading my heart no doubt the holy spirit's influence is just coursing through this situation and he's touching hearts and as those hearts open to him, he's just going in and filling them. And they're coming to Jesus. And so when God's power and presence are, are there, and by the way, this doesn't just force decisions. When God's power comes alive in a church, it not only forces decisions in unbelievers, it forces decisions in believers too. The folks in the, the, folks in the pews have to make some decisions, you know. I don't like going to that church. There's too many new people around. Really? And what exactly is the problem with that? Well, I like the nine that I know. I like the nine I know. I just like to know nine more. <clears throat> we need to put a cap on this now. Need to calm everybody down. Why? We're marching to Zion. Let's just march. Second truth, and this is really akin to the first. It's like a first cousin twice over, okay? Is that Christian people doing Christian things causes unbelievers to take notice? You don't have to say anything. You don't have to advertise. You don't have to take pictures and send it to the paper. And especially in smaller communities like ours, people know what goes on. They know who the good folks are, and they know who not the good folks. When folks have problems in the community, they know who reaches out to them. They know who helps out. They know who supports. They know who gives. They know who buys stuff and takes care of folks. They also know who goes to church every Sunday and who doesn't. Most folks know that. So there's nothing hidden. And God said to us from the beginning, we're a, we're a city set on a hill. We're literally a church set on a hill. I like that. But God says we're a city set on a hill. We're a light moved out from under the basket so that we can sit on the top of the table and give light to the room. That's our job. Jesus says to let our light shine so that men can see our what? Good works and glorify our Father. Did you catch that? It doesn't say that God wanted us to let our light shine so men could see our good works and pat us on the back. They see our good works, they glorify the God we serve. Anytime somebody, you help somebody out and they say, why do you do that? And you just say, I'm doing it in Jesus' name. Because that name's sweet. It's got good stuff in it. So we look at these last two verses and you have some interesting things. 
Peter has become almost an icon. And in a sense, it's a, it's a scary thing. And we see times in the, in the book of Acts, by the way, where preachers of the gospel become so well known and so revered that they have to caution their audiences, don't worship me. I'm not Jesus. We need to remember that. You know? Because what happens is this. Look at this verse. Well, let me tell you what I'm going to say first. The faithful preaching and the godly deeds of Peter had convinced some or many that he was a true man of God. And that I'm okay with. I think many of them believed he was a prophet. Why? He gave the signs of a prophet. He could heal the sick. He proclaimed truth. He knew the Bible exceedingly well. The Bible suggests that although he was not formally educated, he spoke, uh, what was, he, spoke edu he spoke educated. You know, even the Jewish leaders were just impressed when they heard these men speak. Are these men not ignorant Galileans? Weren't they the ones that hung out with Jesus who was also an ignorant Galilean, and yet when they get in discussions with us, they make us look like monkeys? They have this command of the Bible. They have this automatic recall of all these things. Well, didn't God say through the Holy Spirit he would do that with them? He said he'll bring to your memory. Well, there you go. And so these men, and spent, why Peter? Because Peter is the point, point man. If you look in Acts 2, who was the one that got up to preach with the other apostles? It was Peter. Okay. Who suggested that one be chosen to replace Judas in chapter 1? It was Peter. In the early chapters of Acts, Peter emerges as kind of the, the uh, moving force behind the earliest church. He seems to be the guy who recognizes the fact that at this point in time, now it doesn't last a long time, but at this temporary moment in time, God wants him out front. And so he takes the lead. The man that was healed in chapter 4, who was he healed by? Peter and John. And so, and John is very young at this point. So Peter emerges as, as kind of the man. He develops a tremendous amount of street cred, and word gets around. This guy, Peter, is amazing. The Bible says people brought their sick into the streets. This sounds like Jesus. Laid them on beds and, and placed them so that when Peter walked by, at least his shadow could fall on them. Now, I think what we have here is a little insight into superstition in the first century. And that was the belief that, you know, if a man was truly a miracle worker and had the power of God, his shadow was enough to heal. And we even see hints of that in the ministry of Jesus because there's a time when a woman just brushes the, the, the edge of, of Jesus' robe and is healed, right? But there was a common belief that, you know, if a man was truly a powerful man of God, just his shadow had healing power. Now, does Peter's shadow heal? I don't know. Maybe it does. It may very well be the case. But the reason the people are putting him out there, it's, the, the statement here is not to glorify the power of Peter's shadow. It's to establish the tremendous respect with which this preaching man of God was held. He had established his credibility by his life. He acted like a man of God. Therein is a great lesson for us. He is a great example of one Christian doing Christian things the way you should. But I want you to notice the next verse. It says, crowds gathered from towns around Jerusalem and brought their sick and those tormented with evil spirits. And all of them were healed. Now, how, where do you go with this? Well, the church being completely submitted to God allowed God to be free then to do what needed to be done. You know, if, if, if our church leaders spend all their time dealing with disaffection and, and controversy, they don't have time to do what God called them to do, which is to... Minister the word. You know, 
I mean, the strongest argument I can give you for unity is the fact that unity among God's people enables everybody to be more effective in what we need to be doing. It's a great thing. It's a powerful thing. Now, it has to involve submission to the will of God. You can't have unity in falsehood. You can't say, well, we're going to all agree to do this one thing that's wrong. That's okay because we've all agreed on that way we'll stay united. God's not going to bless that kind of stuff. God doesn't work that way. But these folks have really made an impression, haven't they? This is the third time in the book of Acts it says that the church was held in high regard, even though it is, by the Jewish leader's estimation, a highly controversial and perhaps undesirable movement that they would like to squash out. It's not going to happen. Because the average decent person who believes there is a God and wants to be right with God is going to be persuaded by people who share that value and are living it in their lives. Now, are there a lot of people in our community who could care less? Yeah. There's a lot of folks in our community, you could talk all day long to them and share with them and show them good things, and they don't care. They're so wrapped up right now, maybe not later, but right now they're so wrapped up in themselves and their worldliness that they, they aren't interested. But there are always, folks, we've got to believe this with all our hearts, there are always people out there whom God is preparing. There are always people out there who are being tenderized to the, to the message of the gospel. And our job is to project the message of the gospel out there by life and word in a way so that those people can connect. And then when they come, what do we do? Bring them in. Open door policy. Come on in. We'll love you to death. You know, there's a lot of things you may get sick of in life, but nobody gets sick of being loved to death. So, you know, that's the thing. Now, what do we learn from this passage? Two basic things. It teaches us the kind of wonderful things God can do through people when they do two things. You've got to reject the influence of Satan. You've got to keep that nasty stuff out. Now, that, that means whether it's internally in the church or whether it's internally in the lives of each of us. Because Scripture teaches in many places, if I allow Satan to dominate my life, how's that going to affect all of you? Not going to be a good thing, is it? It's going to discourage you. It's going to preoccupy you. And at a time when you should be studying the Bible and learning the Word of God and going out and serving Jesus with joy and happiness and sharing Him with your friends, you're sitting here worried about me. And that's not good. So, you know, when you reject any of the influences of Satan and when you submit to the will of God, when you just say, I'm going to do what God wants me to do, not going to be distracted. We'll see that one later. I'm not going to allow persecution to, to discourage me. We'll see that later. I'm not going to let hypocrisy reign in my life. We've already seen that one. Satan is constantly pounding on the door. Sometimes he's sitting right next to you. Sometimes he'll ring your number on the phone or send you a text message or whatever. He doesn't walk up in a red suit with, you know, horns and a big long tail. He's not that stupid. He comes to you as your best friend, as your boss at work, as that person you've always looked up to but isn't living the way they should, as your preacher, as, some, as one of the Bible teachers in the church. He can come at us in a hundred different ways. And he'll always find the one that works the most. We've got to learn to say no to him and yes to God. How many times does the Bible say, resist the devil and he'll flee from you? What's the next verse? Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. It's a two-part process. You've got to walk away from one and into the arms of the other. What a beautiful church we see when it throws itself into the arms of God. Let's be that kind of church. Make a decision right now, right here this morning. I want to be that kind of Christian. 
I want to be a part of that kind of church. I want to share that kind of, of belief and faith and, and approach to life. And I want everybody, my prayer is that everybody else in this room will make that decision with me at this same time. Every person in this room is going to make a decision in the next 30 seconds. You're either going to decide I want to be a part of this thing God's doing and I'm going to let God use me to make it happen. Or you're going to say, not interested, leave me alone, maybe later. Everybody in here is going to make that decision. You may need to make a decision to become a Christian. To put your faith in Jesus, repent of your sins, confess his lordship in your life, be baptized into Christ. That's what they did in the first century. That's what we would ask you to do now. It may be that as a Christian, you're not where you should be. The only person that can change that is you. I've used this for 100 years in preaching. Always remember, if you're further from God now than you were yesterday, God's not the one who's moved. And if you've moved away from him, what else can you do? You can move back. Make that decision right now. State it to somebody else before you leave this morning. Let them know your decision. I have decided to follow Jesus faithfully, starting right now while we stand and sing.